I'm very honored to be asked to speak uh, this afternoon. Uh, as I've been uh, introduced by Mr. Lee, uh, I've been uh, working for the Chinese government for a long time, although I'm a businessman in Hong Kong. Uh, I serve two terms as a member, as a delegate of the uh, NPC, National People's Congress of China, two terms, 10 years. And then I moved to CCPPC, uh, being a standing committee member for 15 years. And uh, if I'm lucky, I will retire next year. If I'm not lucky, I will be working for another five years. Um, I think I've just given you some terms, NPC, CCPPC. Actually, there are more terms in China, uh, PLA, uh, the most uh, popular work is PRC. I think PRC means uh, People's Republic of China. NPC is uh, National People Congress. CPPCC, Chinese People Political Consultative Committee. CCP, I think everybody knows, the Communist Party of China. Uh, NCCP, National Congress of the Communist Party. CCCP is a central committee of the Communist Party. PSC, Politburo Standing Committee. I think people always find a lot of us uh, having meeting in March in uh, the Great Hall of People. And then uh, they call the Leung Wui, the two, two Congress which is NPC and CCPPC. And then you find every year, sometimes uh, between uh, September to November, usually it's in October, they have this uh, uh, National Congress of the Communist Party. So how does it work? What are all those uh, terms means? Well, first of all, I must explain to all of you, uh, the government structure of China. Well, as you know, the system in China is a very unique system uh, to the world. They have a uh, one-party system, uh, which is the Communist Party of China. Actually, there are more parties. Besides the Communist Party of China, they have some very small political parties that were exist before the communists took over in China in 1949. So after the, the Communist Party of China took over the whole China, they create, well actually they reconvene a political meeting which called CCPPC. Uh, those, is the, those meetings, well those, this is a meeting that the political parties of China before the communists lose. They have this uh, meeting. So they recall this meeting, and then from this meeting, they form the, they form the government of the People's Republic, People's Republic of China. So actually, the CCPPC is the first Congress of China. And then later on, they have elect the national, uh, they have this NPC, National People's Congress, and they elect the delegates. That is become the Congress of China. So between the two, uh, two Congress, the NPC and CCPPC, uh, this is like uh, in UK, the House of Commons and the House of Lord. Well, it's not exactly like that, but uh, they have this uh, uh, similar to this system. And then they have a big meeting, only once every year, which is in March. That's why in every March, you have all the news in the world, 
the people, the delegates go to meet in the Great Hall of uh, 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 People of China, uh, in the Great Hall of uh, uh, the People Hall of China, and then uh, you see a lot of them having meeting. Well, there are about uh, 2,000, more than 2,000 NPC delegates. So they cannot have meeting all the time. So they only meet once a year. The, actually, the real Congress of China is the Standing Committee of the NPC, which they meet every two months in China. So this is the government. Now, the Chinese government is very unique. They have, according to the Chinese constitution, there is only one ruling party, which is the Communist Party. So they have this Communist Party Congress every year in around October. And every five years, they, uh, they elect a the new delegate to the Communist Party meeting. So this year, this October, is the 13th uh, party congress of the Communist Party. They elect the new leaders of the party, and they have formed a Politburo, which is around 25, 27. I, I don't have the exact number in mind. I think it's between 20 to 30. A member of the Politburo. And then with that Politburo, they elect seven of the standing committee members of the Polit, uh, Politburo. So this is the PSC, seven of them. The head of the Politburo is uh, Xi Jinping, and he is number one. And then they have six men assist him. So this is seven member. Now within these seven people, they control the Politburo. And the Politburo control the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. And uh, there are about 200 to 300 uh, Central Committee member. I mean, this is Central Committee member around 200, and then they have this Haobo Wai Yun. Whenever uh, there is a vacancy, uh, the Haobo Wai Yun fulfill the, the, the vacancy. So this is around 250 people. And those are the core of the Communist Party. And total party member in China is around seven million people, which is bigger than a lot of population of a lot of relations in the world. So this is how the government works in China. One government, I mean one political party, control the government, and then they have this meeting uh, every four, and then they have the policy set up, and then they bring to the Every March, they have this big meeting, the NPC meeting and the CCPPC meeting. And then they, for every five years, the NPC elect the chairman of the nation, the chairman of the PRC, and the uh, prime minister of, the, uh, uh, of China. So that's how the government works. Now, this year, this October, they have this uh, Communist Party meeting. So actually, they have already set up all who should be the, the, the chairman of the, of the country and who should be the prime minister. And then next year, in March, NPC meeting will formally elect them. And then they have a government for five years. So this is the system. And. Uh, why this year is so important? Because this year is a year uh, they form the new five years policy. And then uh, since that would be ten, uh, Xi Jinping's second term in office, so he second term means that 
he he can consolidate all his influence within the party and within the government. So whatever decided for uh, in this uh, October meeting would be the policy for Chinese for China for five years and possibly for many years to come. That's why it's so important. Uh, it was 1949 when China, uh, when the Communist Party united China. China were under a lot of turmoil in the past 100 years, in the past centuries. There were a lot of civil war, and they gone through the Second World War, and uh, China was in uh, the edge of bankruptcy. And then, uh, during the final civil war, the Communist Party took over the government and uh, established the PRC, the People's Republic of China. Now, for a long time, uh, China were under uh, the revolutionary generation to rule China. That was Mao Zedong uh, heir. And then he got old, and then after he's got old, he still thinks that uh, he is almighty, he is, uh, he is everything, so he refused to retire. And that's why, for a period of time, China has gone into big trouble, which we call the Cultural Revolution. That was in the 60s and in the early 70s. And then Mao died. And then, I think the famous guy took over, his name was uh, Tang Xiaoping. He reformed China, and from his race into power, start to reform China. China were from a very, very poor country, one of the poorest in the world, and become a world power. In the past 40 years, uh, that was my time, I'm 71 years old next month, and I experienced the whole transformation of China from a very poor country in turmoil during the Cultural Revolution and then reform. And for 40 years, China from nothing become what China is today. So in the past 40 years, after Teng Xiaoping got in power and took the reform of China, if you follow whatever the Chinese government planned to do, and you follow exactly when they say, well, we start to industrialize, you invest in industry. When China is still moving up, and then you invest in the other industry, like the, 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 the properties market, or you've gone into the information market. And uh, if you follow every move by the Chinese government, decision to move into. I think you become the richest man on earth. Well, I'm not because I'm stupid, uh, so stupid that I only follow a little bit and did not follow the uh, invest in poverty and other things. Yeah. So that was China. And uh, I remember when I firstly moved into uh, China uh, from Hong Kong, uh, I remember all the cars in China, there's only two colors, well, three colors. For every 200 cars, 190 cars were black. Nine cars were gray. One car is white. This is the ambulance. <laughs> uh, now, you go to China, they are the biggest manufacturer of automobile in the world. They are the biggest uh, manufacturer in the world. They are the second biggest economy in the world. And uh, with a little bit of luck, 10 years later, they could be the biggest economy in the world. So it is very important that if we still believe in China, we believe, we, we follow their policy and move into the fields that we should be invested in. Uh, I think uh, this train will continue. Uh, as I said, I moved into China 40 years ago. Uh, I moved 
some of my most of my Hong Kong uh, industry in the China, and then we invest in China, and uh, I invest in the wrong industry, which is a textile industry. It was very important industry 50 years ago in Hong Kong, 40 years ago in China, but then now it's a diminishing industry. But then I'm still benefiting to it. What happened was I invested, a John, I got in the joint venture in Wu Si, and then uh, we established together a spinning weaving factory from nothing, from a very small factory, very old factory, hand down that from the past, and then we put into more capital into it, and then we build up. Now, in China, well, probably in the world, we are the biggest compact yarn in the manufacturer uh, in China. Compact yarn is a yarn that without the, is very smooth. So when you weave into garment, the garment would be very nice. We export a lot to Italy, and then they weave into fabric, and, they, and, and then they make into garment and call it make in Italy. And then we, we export to Hong Kong, we spend a lot of money to buy those garments. But actually, the yang is from China. Uh, this industry got into trouble. But then, uh, because we face a lot of competition from the west of the world. But then China have this one bell, one row system. So we follow this system, and then we establish a joint venture, or our joint venture in China invested well, in the Ethiopia. Our factory is going to open next year. And we will invest 220 million US dollars into this factory in Ethiopia. Now that's, well, for a, for a textile manufacturer, there's a lot of money. But then there is a fund called the One Row, One, one Bell, One Row Fund. We can borrow more than 80% of, uh, of the investment from the Chinese government to invest in Ethiopia. We only spend a, 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 a small amount, and then we have to, we, we can invest this into Ethiopia. So I think this could be one of the examples that uh, our business people in the world to look at this one bell, one rose uh, initiative to use the one bell, one no fund to invest in a lot of the country, in, even in your own country, with the Chinese government money. So that would be one of the ways that we can enlarge our business as well as benefit the third world country as well as do a lot of profitable business. Now I have a firm, uh, a kind of uh, um, advertising uh, uh, a firm of, uh, to promote this one bell one no, to promote this factory in Ethiopia. So uh, if you have some time, maybe I would like you to watch this uh, film. Unfortunately, it is in Mandarin. But I think uh, it's time that for you uh, to learn more Mandarin, because <laughs> if, you, if you want to work with China, Mandarin is a language. So uh, bear with me. Uh, it's this is the place uh, our John Venture in Wuxi, Jiangsu Province. This is a very old factory. Kaitwang 
将优先扶持本国优势产业走出去。中国纺织占全球纺织贸易三分天下，是中国具有国际竞争力的优势产业。二零一六年。中国纺织产业直接对外投资创下历史新高，达二十六点六亿美金，同比增长百分之八十九点三。江苏纺织企业无论是对外投资规模，还是走出去的企业数量，都是其中佼佼者。亚欧大陆最东端，中国经济最发达的长三角地区，太湖之滨的无锡伊棉。历经百年沧桑，依然是中国最先进的纺织企业。其智能化工厂创造了每万锭用工二十五人之内的国际一流水平，拥有六十万纱锭、六百台织机，年产高档纱线三万吨、高档织物五千万米，是全球最大的紧密防纱基地。泰勒克牌紧密防纱线。特高支纱线、特种混纺纱线，出口全球纺织高端市场，是世界顶级的色织、针织面料用户的配套供应商，在欧洲、亚洲和美洲五十五个国家和地区注册，被欧洲客商誉为全球最优秀的工厂之一。古丝绸之路的最西端，神秘遥远的非洲大陆，埃塞俄比亚如同明珠一样闪耀在非洲屋脊。是东非地区乃至整个非洲最重要的国家之一。那里气候温润，水利资源丰富，拥有优质的棉花和广袤的土地。首都亚迪斯亚贝巴是联合国非洲经济委员会和非洲联盟总部所在地，也是进出非洲的主要交通枢纽之一。从埃塞俄比亚出口欧洲、美洲的纺织品，比中国出口到欧洲、美洲物流更快捷。而欧盟、美国对在埃塞生产出口的商品实行零关税优惠。埃塞致力于打造非洲领先的制造业中心，纺织工业是其优先发展的支柱行业，力争2025年纺织业达三百亿美金的非洲最大规模。一免。正翘首凝望远方，埃塞正求贤如渴，以免欲输出纺织产能，埃塞正要引进发展。遥远的埃塞，作为同中国签订国际产能合作文件的二十七个国家之一，吸引了万里之外的无锡伊棉的目光。遥远的古丝绸之路，穿过历史的尘埃。向伊棉人发出声声召唤。在无锡伊棉百年来临之际的埃塞项目，既是伊棉开创下一个百年的新起点，又是无锡国联集团首个实业对外投资项目，更是无锡市政府的重大对外投资项目之一。二零一六年十月，埃塞俄比亚在上海举行投资交流会，分享投资非洲红利的历史机遇。无锡伊棉与埃塞第一次握手。二零一七年四月，无锡国联率麾下企业奔赴埃塞，对其社会环境、投资环境、基础设施、国家工业园进行实地考察。五月十二日，北京“一带一路”峰会前夕，埃塞总理与中国纺织企业家面对面交流。五月二十六日，无锡市国有企业重大投资项目签约仪式。无锡伊棉纺织集团有限公司董事长周叶俊与埃塞俄比亚 m o l i t e r i c a n 大使正式签署投资谅解备忘录。五月二十九日，无锡国联集团董事局主席高敏专赴上海，与埃塞总理特别顾问阿尔卡贝博士就伊棉埃塞投资项目达成共识。九月七日，南京，二零一七中国纺织业走出去大会。埃塞政府代表团专程奔赴无锡伊棉考察，双方再次对项目进行深度沟通。六月和九月，无锡伊棉埃塞投资项目小组成员两赴埃塞，开展尽职调查和可研报告编制，并与埃塞投资委进行项目细节洽谈、项目用地征选工作启动。德雷达瓦位于埃塞俄比亚东部。是埃塞的特别行政市和东部交通枢纽、商业中心，距离埃塞首都亚迪斯亚贝巴四百公里
，也是亚吉铁路的沿线城市。德雷达瓦工业园是埃塞政府首批开发建设的国家工业园之一，占地四十二平方公里，是埃塞距离吉布提港口最近的工业园，距吉布提港口三百公里，距离亚吉铁路车站仅五公里左右，交通运输优势明显。九月二十二日。无锡第三届全球西商大会再次吹响西商响应“一带一路”走出去集结号。九月二十八、二十九日，在埃塞政府代表团出席二零一七中国服装杭州峰会之际，双方再次就投资协议各项条款进行深度沟通，为协议的正式签订打下坚实的基础。项目计划用地四十公顷。总投资二点二亿美元，规划建设三十万沙锭，分两期建设，主要生产配套高档色织、针织、家纺的产品，可提供三千人就业。首期十万沙锭项目计划于今年年底开工，二零一九年下半年投产运行。一年将在广袤的非洲，在更广阔的世界舞台翱翔。将把先进纺织技术、绿色制造带到埃塞，推进埃塞工业化进程在双赢中发展。百年前的伊缅树立了实业救国的远大抱负，今天的伊缅将把实业精神远播海外，在世界经济的版图上开展更高层次的产业布局。金色秋天。让我们共同见证，无锡一年与埃塞正式签订在德雷达瓦国家工业园投资纺织工业生产基地的协议。穿过关山，越过大海，根植本土，丝路全球，“一带一路”将会更加宽广，更加绵长。啊。That's me. This is the um, um, how do you do that? Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, the one in red uh, is the is the is a factory that we are building. Uh, this is in the industrial area. They even named the road Uzi uh, Boulevard to uh, to. Uh, 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 for our investment. Hmm. I'm not working. Uh, doesn't matter. Uh, so what happened is, um, 35 years ago, we invest, uh, do a joint venture in China, uh, with, uh, some investment. And then, uh, 30 years later, this become, this investment become the biggest uh, compact yarn industry uh, manufacturer in China, probably the world. And then we using the Chinese government money to invest in Africa. Now that, that would be the model for, uh, for, for, for working with China, using the one row, one bell, one row uh, initiative. Uh, how does the Chinese government work? Uh, I have explained uh, briefly. So in October, they have this meeting, uh, the Chinese Communist Party meeting, and then they plan a goal to achieve it. They plan China in the years of 2050 would be the what they call a beautiful, without uh, pollution, without uh, um, a green country. Uh, in industry, they can provide a lot of uh, uh, substantial uh, industry, and the economy would be uh, one of the strongest and biggest in the world. Well, the population of China is about uh, um, seven times of Japan. And uh, if the plan of the Chinese government 
uh, is successful by the years of 2050, that would be seven Japan. So that could be a dream for China. Would that dream be successful? Uh, I don't know. But then, uh, within the past experience, in the past 40 years, whatever the Chinese government decided to do, they did it. And they achieved. So maybe this dream of Jinping, uh, Xi Jinping, is not merely a dream. Maybe this could be achievable. So uh, in order for him to achieve it, he set up 11 way, 11 pawn to work it out. Uh, let me see whether I can get this uh, to you. Now, uh, he has 14 fundamental principles uh, highlighted by him. Uh, first of all, he wants to ensure the Communist Party lead leadership of all over China on every field. Uh, he wants to commit a people-centered approach. Yan Wai Bun. He wants to continue to comprehensively deepen the reform of China. This is the reform of Deng Xiaoping. He wants to continue to do that. He wants to adopt a new version of development, which is a green China, a sustainable China. Uh, he wants to see that the people run the country. He wants to ensure every dimension of governance is in law based. That is uh, Yi Guo. He wants to uphold the core socialist value. That is, he still he believes that uh, the socialism with Chinese characteristics is the future for China. He wants to ensure an improving living standard through development. So development is very important. No development, no future. He wants to ensure harmony between human and nature, which is a green China, uh, zero pollution. He wants to pursue a holistic approach to national security. Well, you know that uh, uh, China is not a homogeneous country. China is uh, with a lot of minority race. So he wants harmony and he wants uh, the whole China to be secured. Uh, he wants upholding absolute party leadership over the army. So uh, no army in control. He wants to uh, the party control the army, so no military dictatorship. He wants to uphold the principle of one country, two system, and promoting national reunification. Uh, this is very important for Hong Kong, because with the one country system, Hong Kong is uh, being prosperous. Well, Hong Kong is the only place uh, in China that we do not contribute our economy. Uh, we don't have to pay any tax to the central government. Whereas in Shanghai, 50% of the revenue of Shanghai is, uh, uh, have to be uh, given to the central government. And then Shanghai government only keep 50%. This is the same thing happened to Guangdong government. And Hong Kong government keep 100% of its revenue for Hong Kong use only. Uh, promoting the building of a community with a shared future for mankind. Uh, he is talking about the whole world. This is not only for China. Uh, China don't want to be uh, influenced the other country, but at the same time, the, he doesn't want any foreign country to bother with the internal business of China. Uh, the last one is exercising full 
and regular governor over the party. Uh, this one is very important because there's only one party in China and that absolute power become uh, absolute uh, corruption. So the corruption in China is very high and Xi Jinping is using all his energy, most of his energy, to curb corruption. So you can find the new every day that uh, a, a lot of corruption being uh, uh, um, uh, uh, attacked, uh, being a lot of people, if they're corrupted, uh, the central government is zero tolerance to corruption. Uh, if uh, only one party in control of a country, and if there is uh, no cure to the poor corruption, China can only go one way, which is uh, 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 hold this integration. So to fight corruption is the utmost important. So uh, this is the 14th point uh, Xi Jinping highlighted uh, uh, in the uh, Communist Party conference, and he want to enforce it in, uh, uh, in the meeting, in the NPC meeting uh, next March, and hopefully he can achieve his goal. Um, I don't know whether I have uh, explained fully of uh, the whole system in China, but I think Hong Kong is a very elite situation. Uh, we have uh, enjoyed this one country, two system. We don't contribute to the central government. And then at the same time, there is a lot of uh, different voices in Hong Kong uh, to against the central government. So we must find a way within Hong Kong uh, to understand our elite position. Uh, in order Hong Kong to be sustained uh, with this uh, one country, two system, without any changes within 50 years, and hopefully after 50 years, we can still practice this one country, two system. Hong Kong must be very alert to understand our po position, and we must work together with China. Together, uh, Hong Kong will pro uh, prosperous. But if Hong Kong become a base to against the Chinese government, I think the future of Hong Kong will be in jeopardy. Uh, I would like to conclude my talk, and uh, there's still a lot of questions remain, and I hope that I can answer your question uh, during the uh, question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chen, for sharing your insights with us. And before I'm going to test all the audience what PRC, MPC, CPP, CC, CCP, NCCP, CCCP, and PSC standing for, I'm going to open up the floor for questions. So, uh, any questions? All right, this is from our audience. So according to the latest policy address released in October, the opportunities brought by the Belt and Road Initiative, as you just discussed, and also the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau Bay area have been highlighted. In your opinion, what would be the other major driving force for the Hong Kong economy? Uh, the what force? Uh, the other driving, major oh. driving force and, uh, uh, for the Hong Kong economy? Yeah. Well, I think for the one pair one row, uh, Hong Kong can be benefited a lot. Uh, like I've just mentioned that on my personal case, that uh, I used the one pair one row system uh, initiative to invest it to uh, the third world country using Chinese management using Chinese finance, and then I'm just sitting in Hong Kong, and then we can have this benefit. So this is uh, one way if you are a businessman. 
But if you are a professional, there are even more opportunity. I think uh, there's a different law within the one bell run low country. So in order for the Chinese enterprise to expand their influence in the one bell one road uh, country, they need a law of law uh, assistance from Hong Kong. Uh, they also need a lot of law assistance from uh, your country, uh, as well as accountant. A professional uh, service from Hong Kong uh, is very important. I think this will be greatly uh, uh, um, benefited with the one bell one road system uh, 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 initiative. With the big uh, Hong Kong, Macau, and Guangdong Bay Area Initiative. Uh, with Hong Kong, sitting in Hong Kong, we are the financial center, and uh, there will be a lot more development within this Bay Area. So our financial services can uh, do more business uh, when this area flourish. At the same time, I think uh, Hong Kong can assist a lot of the foreign investment in this Bay Area of uh, uh, Southern China. And uh, being uh, um, uh, uh, Hong Kong, we become the bridge of China to the world. So uh, I think for the Hong Kong future, uh, we'll be greatly uh, benefited with these two initiatives. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do have another question for you. So time sure flies, and now we are on the 20th anniversary of the handover. So it's 20 years after the handover. So what do you think the Hong Kong government can point to the major accomplishments that Hong Kong can build upon in the coming 30 years? Uh, I think uh, they're talking about 50 years, uh, no change. 40% of the time has passed. Uh, like uh, Danny said, it's 20 years old, uh, passed already. I can tell you there's a lot of uh, things that we haven't accomplished. Uh, according to the basic law, uh, we have to enact uh, Article 23, which is a law uh, to protect the integrity of China as a whole. Uh, uh, and uh, we still uh, haven't put this into law in Hong Kong. I think this is something China is waiting for Hong Kong to add. Uh, China has no patience to wait forever. And this is a law that would not harm the people of Hong Kong. In fact, it will protect China as well as protecting Hong Kong. So uh, I think... Uh, the people of Hong Kong should be uh, more proactive into the merging with China in terms of economy as well as politically. Politically, we want to remain this one country, two system. That we have our self-government, overlaid by the central government. But at the same time, we have to protect the interests of China, which will not be harmed uh, in Hong Kong. I, I think what China's worry about Hong Kong is Hong Kong become a base for the foreign uh, uh, a power to, uh, to uh, how do you call that, to, uh, to influence the internal politics of China. Uh, I think what China worry is uh, uh, Hong Kong will be used as the color revolution base to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, jeopardize the, the central government. So that is what China worry about Hong Kong. So I would like to use this opportunity because there's so many uh, foreign dignitary in this, uh, in this room. Uh, we must understand the situation of Hong Kong. We are sitting into a very uh, 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 unique place that we have to satisfy our own people as well as satisfy China. So uh, I think for the remaining 30 years for Hong Kong to achieve uh, is to, uh, uh, to make sure
this one country, two system works. It works for Hong Kong as well for work for China. So this is very important. And then uh, one thing Hong Kong is very good for is for our uh, financial services and professional services. That will help China to move out and it will help the Hong Kong economy and it will help the economy in the whole world. So uh, I think this is something that uh, Hong Kong can be achieved in the coming 30 years. And I hope that after 30 years, we will extend it into another 50 years of this one country, two system uh, policy. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. So being the moderator, I always have the liberty to I me mean, ask my own questions, if I may. Yes. <laughs> So I have done a little bit of research, even though, I mean, um, uh, it comes with not too many about you, but I know that, quote and unquote, you have stated in, uh, during in April of this year that housing and other livelihood issues are more pressing for the incoming Hong Kong leader. So what are really the major challenges and opportunities you can see now in the Hong Kong's uh, upcoming development, and what are your words? I mean, now that we have a new CE and Mrs. Carrie Lam is going to be our keynote speaker. So what do you see that, you know, what do we need to do to really further bring Hong Kong to the next level so that we are more competitive with the other cities and countries in Asia? Uh, I think Hong Kong is facing a dilemma. And uh, I think in the past few years, you can see some turmoil in Hong Kong we have this Jin Ling Zhong Wang, Occupy Central. Uh, uh, some young Hong Kong people occupy central area for Hong Kong for more than almost three months, two and a half months. And you can see uh, two years ago during uh, uh, Chinese, New, Chinese New Year or Western New Year, I forgot, uh, that we have this riot in Mong Kok. And uh, young people against uh, against the government. I, I think uh, the young people in Hong Kong uh, is facing a big problem. Although they receive a very good education, mostly a uh, university graduated or even higher uh, education, uh, but then uh, after they graduated. Of, of course, they can find a job, find a job very easy in Hong Kong. But then, they have to pay rent. They got married, both, half, uh, both uh, men and wife are working. But they sorry add up together, they could not buy a flat, buy an apartment to live in Hong Kong because too expensive. So, they cannot see a very bright future for themselves. Not when I was a young man, I can see a very bright future for me. But they don't see that anymore. So they, have a, they are very upset to, uh, to the situation in Hong Kong. So from this upset, upsetness, they, uh, they, they, they turn their... their their anger to the Hong Kong government, and they turn their anger to the central government. And, and that would be uh, a very big problem in the future of Hong Kong. So uh, I think for the Hong Kong government, now we have a new CE, uh, for the Hong Kong government, they have to look at the housing uh, 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 um, development very seriously. I think every government in Hong Kong for the past 20 years, they look at the housing uh, problem very seriously, but every one of them fail. Why? Because they have a lot of West interest in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, if there are more land being sold in Hong Kong, if there are more land being uh, 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 on the market in Hong Kong, uh, some of the big enterprise might be uh, uh, not very easy because they're afraid that they are whatever they own, will the, the value will come down. Uh, or maybe I say the wrong thing. Uh, 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 so that, that's the problem. So, uh, and then 
uh, for the past 20 years, the Hong Kong government become uh, a very weak government. They, uh, uh, since uh, the direct election in Hong Kong hasn't been uh, uh, implemented, the government uh, do not have the full mandate from, from the people. So it's a very weak government and they cannot uh, face uh, uh, the different pressure group. Uh, so they, 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 whenever they, 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 they face an opposition uh, uh, force, uh, try to uh, oppose their policy, they, uh, they stop. Uh, so they could not find land in Hong Kong. I think land is everywhere in Hong Kong. You drive from Hong Kong Central to the airport, you find a lot of empty land, and they say they cannot find enough land. They must be strong government, full support the government. And then the government find more land, they build more housing to let the younger people to have a future. Every people can afford to buy housing. And then uh, we can, Hong Kong can be a better place to stay. So housing is very important for Kerry Lam. I have full confidence with our new CEO because I think Kerry actually is carrying the same policy of the past administration. But then, it seems that under her hand, uh, she can pass the legislation easier than before. So I have full confidence to our CEO. Uh, I think ladies do have something that uh, men do not have. That, uh, <laughs> that, that <laughs> uh, that's including TDC, eh? <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Mr. Chen, I mean, to be political correct, I have to echo the same statement as well, too. Since I see that at least more than half of the audience are ladies, so I don't want to get into troubles. So we have only two minutes left, so I'm going to have a very quick question from Japan. So the uh, Baron Road projects, that as uh, you just bring it up in South Africa, is it really proposed by you and the uh, China government? Well, I always want expansion, and uh, is our partner in Wuxi, they brought up this Ethiopian uh, venture, and I support them 100%. Well, again, I must compliment the ladies. The, many, the, the, the chairman of our uh, organization in Wuxi is a lady, uh, Ms. Chow, and she's very capable, she brought up this idea, of Ethiopia, and she has my full support, and also full support by the Chinese government. So, uh, do I answer the question? I yeah. think you did. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The last questions. Well, it's a tough one. I don't know whether I can answer their questions. I, I, I think you do. You can. Can you use five words to describe Hong Kong? Five. No more than five. I'm a number cruncher, so I'm going to count it. <laughs> I don't know whether I can use five words. Okay, I, I but, give you 10 words. But, but Hong Kong is a beautiful place, and I want to live in Hong Kong. I want to die in Hong Kong. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Yeah. We are again very fortunate to have Mr. Chan Thank here. You. Thank you very much. So, Thank you Thank very you. much.